Well, today we are wrapping up our series called Ordinary Everyday Mission as we've been looking at how we can join Jesus in his mission to redeem and transform everything, of which our part, as we've seen in the Great Commandment and the Great Commission, our part is to love God, is to love others, and is to make disciples of Jesus, to help each other follow him with our lives. Now, after we spend some time defining what this mission of God looks like, we looked at this concept of discipleship, the idea that we are to follow Jesus, to learn what he taught, and to live our lives the way that he did. And and within discipleship, while there's all kinds of different things that we could talk about, whether it's like spiritual gifts and how we can use our abilities to serve others, how we're called to be generous, how we're called to you know, make him our number one priority and follow him. The main thing that we looked at is how following Jesus starts with a willingness to let go and let God, right? That idea of letting go of control, of trusting God with our lives and doing what he says, even if we don't always understand why. In fact, that's usually the hardest time to do it, but when we do that and when God comes through for us, it builds our faith. It builds our trust in him. And so it's not easy, but it's worth it. And one of the biggest reasons why it's worth it is because of Jesus, right? Jesus has done everything for us, bringing peace, bringing life, bringing love in here so that when we face the hardships and the struggles out there, when we face the challenges and the trials in our lives, we know that he will carry us through because he's always there to help us. Now from discipleship, we then shifted our focus to look at how following Jesus includes leading other people to Jesus, a process that we call evangelism. And leading others to Jesus actually fulfills all aspects of that loving God, loving others, and making disciples, right? It's loving to God because in sharing Jesus with others, we're magnifying and we're glorifying God to other people. When we share Jesus with other people, it's the most loving thing that we can actually do for them. Why? Because a relationship with Jesus is the greatest thing in the world. And we all need Jesus. And of course, in evangelism, I mean, sharing Jesus with others is how we make disciples. It's how we introduce people to Jesus. And so last week, we looked at not only why we should share the good news of Jesus with others, but we also looked at five tips for evangelism. Uh, They were, uh, first, evangelism is for every follower of Jesus, right? Each and every one of us is called to share the good news of Jesus with others. Second, we're supposed to pray, right? We need to pray. We need God to go with us as we go and share the good news of Jesus with other people. And so pray and ask God to prepare you and to give you opportunities to share Jesus with others. And, And ask God to put on your heart specific individuals, that he wants you to invest your life into. Third, bring Jesus into your everyday conversations. Uh, In our volunteer meeting that we have before every Sunday morning, uh, Tracy actually shared with us about how just in her interactions with somebody that she thought, man, they would never turn to Jesus. But as she continued to talk about God, as she continued to talk about Jesus and his effect on her life, how that individual is now asking her to pray for her. And so, again, as we share about Jesus just in our everyday conversations, it opens doors. It opens opportunities to share more. Fourth, we need to pursue people of peace, right? We need to share Jesus generously with everyone, but we need to be aware of who is open to him. And when we recognize those people who are open to him, we need to share more. We need to teach them. We need to help them to understand the love and the goodness and the greatness of our God. Of course, those people who are apathetic towards Jesus or maybe even antagonistic towards them, we also saw that we need to give them back to God, right? We need to give back to God those who resist Jesus, trusting and hoping that maybe when we share the gospel with them, even though they were close to it at that time, that might have been a seed that God planted. And years down the road, just maybe God will help them to turn to him. Now with that said, one of the biggest hurdles or challenges that we face when it comes to talking to people about Jesus or sharing God's love with them 
or encouraging each other to follow Jesus is that we often don't know how, right? We don't know how to share Jesus with others, right? One of the reasons is that we don't feel capable, right? We don't feel capable. We don't think that we're wise enough to answer people's questions, or maybe we don't think we're mature enough to talk about Jesus with others because they might judge Jesus based on how we've lived our lives. And we are so far from how amazing God is. Or, or perhaps we're afraid, right? We're, we're afraid that they'll reject us. We're afraid of how they'll react, they'll react. We're afraid that they might lump us in with like a crazy cult or with, you know, people like Ned Flanders on The Simpsons where they're just kind of crazy, right? Heidi Ho neighbor, like you know, a little bit kind of weird. And so we're, we're, we're afraid. Well, friends, I can't give you an answer for all of our fears and doubts except to say that Jesus will always be with us. He will always be with us and he will help us. In fact, he promised in the Great Commission saying, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. All right, we don't go alone. Jesus promised to never leave us and to always be with us. However, on top of that, Jesus has also given us a way to talk to others about him and to encourage and share his love with others in a way that is uncomplicated and actually quite easy. And it's simply through the power of your story. It's through the power of your story. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Now, when the Bible talks about sharing the good news of Jesus with others, it often does so in a number of different ways. For example, last week when we looked at how Jesus sent out 72 of his followers to go and, and, and proclaim the gospel to other towns and villages and people in that area, we saw that Jesus sent them out with this message. He told them to say, the kingdom of God has come near to you. That was in Luke chapter 10. Whereas when we move into uh, the book of Acts, the recording of what happened in the early church, we see multiple times where the apostles and the church leaders, when they were preaching to the Jews, they shared about how Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament uh, law and prophecies. And then later in the book of Acts, the apostle Paul, with, along with others, uh, reasoned with the Gentiles through the Gentiles' own cultural and religious understandings. Now, one of the examples is when the Apostle Paul actually went into one of their uh, pagan areas of worship. And as he's wandering around, he's seeing all of these different altars. And he stops at one of them, and he begins to talk to people. And in Acts 17, 23, he said this, As I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. And so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Now, friends, we need to understand that even though all of these presentations of the gospel sound very different to our ears, the message is still the same. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus, right? Jesus, the king of God's kingdom, the fulfillment of the Old Testament law and prophecies, the unknown but one true God has come to save us. He's come to save us. And so it's a beautiful message. But I know some of you are right now thinking, <laughs> hold on a second, right? These historical accounts that we just read about in Scripture, they can make us a little bit nervous, right? They can make us nervous to talk to others about Jesus because it makes us makes it sound like we really need to know our stuff. That we need to be like experts in theology or that we need to be cultural and historical geniuses who can make the connections that the early church leaders and guys like the Apostle Paul made when they presented the good news of Jesus. But friends, that's not the case. In fact, God has given all of his followers a way to share about Jesus that's really easy. And we see this method and one of the ways that Jesus said his followers would share about him with others. Many times in the gospel accounts, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four different perspectives on the life and the ministry of Jesus. 
many times we see that Jesus told his followers to testify about what they saw, about what he said, and about what he did. In fact, he often said that his followers would be his witnesses, right, of, of his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection, kind of like being a witness in a court of law testifying to the truth. Now, none of us were there. Right? We weren't there, and so we can't be eyewitnesses of Jesus' life and ministry, his death and his resurrection, but we are witnesses of Jesus. We are witnesses of Jesus and what he has done in our lives. And we can testify to what Jesus has done for us, just as many people did after they encountered Jesus. In fact, throughout the Gospels, we have story after story after story of people who encountered Jesus. They didn't know much, but what they had, what they knew, they shared with others. Let me give you a a few examples. Uh, When Jesus interacted with a woman at a well, a woman whose life was a mess, who had had five husbands and was living with another man, well, her life was so changed that she went from avoiding others by going to draw water when no one else was at the well to as we see in John chapter 4 after talking with Jesus she left her water jar and the woman went back to the town and said to the people come see a man who told me everything I ever did could this be the Messiah I come see the man who told me everything I ever did Friends, her faith, her trust in Jesus allowed her to take her moral failings, those things that she was embarrassed about, those things that she maybe hated about herself, those things that she probably tried to keep hidden. But her faith and her trust in Jesus allowed her to go, hey, you guys know all my dirty laundry. But come, come and see the guy who told me everything I ever did and yet still loved me and yet still accepted me. She used it as an opportunity, just a simple interaction with Jesus, she used as an opportunity to bring others to Jesus. Or there's the blind man that Jesus healed. Friends, Jesus didn't always make it easy for people, even those he healed. And in John chapter 9, Jesus and his followers came across a blind man who was actually blind from birth. He was born blind. Well, after setting the disciples straight on the fact that the man's blindness was not a direct result of his own sin or the sin of his parents, uh, even as we've looked at in this series that, that sickness and illness and natural disasters and everything bad in this world is a result of sin in general, right? Jesus then spat on the ground. He mixed his spit with the dust and the dirt to make mud. And he went and he put it on the man's eyes and told him to go and wash in a pool for washing. And so this blind man had to kind of stumble along and get the help of people to lead him to the pool. But when he washed, he could see. He could see. Now, unfortunately, because he had to go to the pool in order to wash his eyes, in order to be able to see, he hadn't actually seen Jesus. In fact, he didn't see Jesus until a while later when Jesus found him. But before that even happened, the blind man who could now see was brought before the religious leaders and questioned because Jesus had healed him on the Sabbath, on the weekly religious holy day when no work was supposed to be done. And so the religious leaders questioned him over and over again. They questioned his parents and then questioned him one more time and they made derogatory statements about Jesus and they leveled accusations towards Jesus all the while trying to get this blind man who's no longer blind to agree to something so that they could charge Jesus so they could arrest him but friends his response is beautiful in John 9:25 he replied to these accusations of how terrible and awful and sinful Jesus is. He said, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but now I see. 
That's it. Right? He didn't know anything else about Jesus. Right? He didn't know much at all, but what he did know, what Jesus had done for him, what Jesus had done in his life, he shared with others. Even the religious leaders who were trying to condemn Jesus. In fact, it ended up costing this blind man in a big way. Well, no longer blind man, right? Uh, it, it cost him in a big way because by pointing them to Jesus, it stirred up the anger of the religious leaders and he ended up getting cast out of the synagogue. And the synagogue, the church at that time, was the center of society. It was the center of a community. If you were cast out of that, you became an outcast in your community. But Jesus found him. He revealed himself to the man. The man worshipped him, and he followed him. It's a beautiful thing. Then there's the example of a man possessed by demons. That's right, demons. Not one, but many. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus came across a madman who lived in the tombs of a graveyard, who ran around naked, who cut himself with stones, but who was so strong that no one could subdue him except Jesus. But Jesus didn't subdue him. No, he freed him. He freed him. Jesus sent the demons out of the man and into a herd of pigs, setting the man free so that he was in his right mind. And as a result of that, the man got dressed in clothes, which is a good thing. And, uh, and, and what, just like the blind man, he wanted to go with Jesus. He wanted to follow Jesus. But this time, Jesus did something different. In Mark chapter 5, verse 19, we read that Jesus didn't let him. Jesus didn't let him come along with him. Instead, he said to the man, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Just like the blind man, just like the woman at the well, this man probably wasn't a great theologian. I mean, he had been possessed by demons for a long time. Uh, he probably wasn't well-informed and well-learned. Right? He probably wasn't an eloquent speaker. He simply knew what Jesus had done for him, and that was enough. And what's amazing, if you keep reading on in the Gospel of Mark, you'll see that the next time Jesus comes around to that area, we don't know if it, it might have been months later, all of a sudden, there's hundreds, maybe even thousands of people who know about Jesus. Why? Because this one man shared his story. This one man shared his story of how Jesus changed and transformed his life. And so, friends, I know for some of you, you're probably sitting here going, man, yeah, let's do this, right? This is enough. Like, you're, you're thinking about how Jesus has impacted your life. You're already formulating a draft of your own story within your mind right now of how you can share the good news of Jesus with other people. But for others of us, we might need a little bit more help. And so I want to quickly, in the next few moments, just share a framework with you that might help you to gather some of the different aspects of your life together into a single cohesive story of how Jesus has changed and transformed your life. And in this framework, uh, this framework is the same one that I actually share with those who go through our baptism and membership class so that they can share their story with us when they get baptized in our tank here, when they become a member of our church so that they can encourage us as well of how Jesus has changed and transformed their lives. Now, the main idea behind this framework is that our stories, all of our stories, are informed, they're influenced, and they're actually based off of God's big story, his huge story that, that spans all the way from Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible. And friends, while God's story is a huge story covering all of time and all of creation, his story in relation to us as humanity has four distinct elements that are evidence of God's grace in our lives. And as you can see on the screen there, those four elements or movements are called creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And friends, we can see these movements in our lives when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus. And so we're going to spend just a few moments. I'm going to kind of quickly outline each of these four elements, as well as give you a couple of questions 
to think about and reflect on so that it can help you to begin to put your own story together that you can share with others. So the first movement that we see is creation. Right? At the very beginning of the Bible, <clears throat> we see that God created a perfect world, a world of peace, beauty, creativity, and goodness. In fact, everything was good. That's that common repetitive phrase that we see in Genesis 1. It is good. It is good. It is good. In fact, at that time, there was no sin or sickness or disease or death. And us people were created in God's image. We were created to be in a relationship with God. It was a perfect world where we were supposed to know God and enjoy Him forever. Of course, this isn't the world that we live in today, and we'll talk about sin and the fall in just a moment. But all of our stories still reflect the goodness of God and His grace in our lives. All of our stories contain evidence that we have been made in His image. So what's good in your life? What's good in your life? How, do, how has your story started out? Right? Looking back over the course of your life, how did things start out? What are the evidences of God's goodness in your life even before you put your faith and your trust in Jesus? What are the evidences of God's grace within you? Because friends, remember, everything good in our life is a gift from God. It comes from Him. Now, like I said, we don't live in a perfect world and that's because of what we often refer to as the fall. While God created the world in goodness, that goodness was broken when the first people chose to trust in themselves instead of God. They wanted to be the center of the universe. Right? They wanted to be God of their own lives, which was actually a rejection of God. And so the result of this first act of sin was brokenness. Brokenness in our relationship with God. Uh, brokenness in our relationships with each other. Uh, brokenness, in, in a sense, in our relationship with ourselves as we struggle with anxieties and worries and all kinds of things within our own very being. And of course, brokenness within creation, as sin has infected and affected everything. And so this brokenness has impacted all of history, and it literally infects everything, including our own lives. Sin is the reason that we experience pain and hardship, strained relationships and the loss of loved ones. And friends, none of us are exempt. None of us are immune to sin. And so how has, this broken, how has the brokenness of this world impacted your life? What pain have you experienced? What decisions of others uh, have brought hurt into your life? And what choices have you made that has caused hurt and pain in your own life and in the lives of other people? Friends, our pain is just as much a part of our story as our creation. And thankfully, the story isn't over. It doesn't end just with our pain and our mistakes. Right? The gospel, the good news of Jesus, points us to redemption. Right? It's the announcement that God has not left us in our brokenness and sin, but he passionately pursues us to rescue us. Right? He did this by becoming flesh and living among us, doing for us what we couldn't possibly do for ourselves. Jesus, God in the flesh, came into this world. He lived a perfect life, something none of us could do. And then he died on the cross. He took the punishment that we deserved for our sin. He took the death that we deserved upon himself, and he died in our place so that we could be forgiven. It's through Jesus' death on the cross that we discover that we are more broken and that our sin is far worse than we ever imagined. But at that very same instant of realization of just how broken and messed up we are, we also understand that through Jesus' actions, we are more loved than we could ever hope. Friends, Jesus didn't stay dead. Being God, he rose again, giving us the hope of new life. 
And so God took something that seemed terrible and he turned it around for good. He took the death of his son, the death of God in the flesh, and he used it to redeem us. Right? That's redemption. And it starts with trusting in Jesus. And so let me ask you, who in your past have you trusted in to rescue you, to make things right in your life, those things apart from Jesus? Because we all try it, right? We all do it. We all go to drugs or work or pornography or other things to try and bring healing and wholeness and a sense of purpose within us. But only Jesus can do that for us. And so let me ask you, do you see Jesus as the answer to your sin? The answer to your brokenness and your self-reliance? Have you actually put your faith and your trust in him? And if you have, well then how is he redeeming aspects of your life? How is he bringing goodness and hope and love out of the brokenness and pain and even despair? Now, we heard Vicky's story earlier. Now, how is he bringing beauty out of the brokenness? How is he bringing healing out of the hurt? That's redemption. Well, the fourth and final movement of God's story is restoration. Right? God's story is the greatest story that, is, that has ever been told. And it culminates in the renewal and restoration of absolutely everything. That's God's mission that we've been looking at throughout this series. And so just think about it. Just think about it. Every hurt, every tear, every pain, every injustice will one day be reversed as God makes all things new. Oh, that will be a glorious day. And friends, while we do wait expectantly for Jesus to return to bring restoration fully and completely, God is even now bringing restoration into our lives. He's bringing restoration into our hearts, into our relationship between us and Him, into our relationships between each other. Right? As the Apostle Paul wrote, right, if we put our faith in Jesus, we have become a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. We are restored already. And so how have you experienced God's restoration? How is he healing or making new in your life? How is God calling you to be a part of his transformation of our world? And when life gets tough, as it always does, how can the hope of heaven... How can the hope of that restoration help you to keep going even when life gets hard? Because friends, we know that life isn't perfect and it won't ever be perfect until Jesus returns. So there you have it. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. God's ultimate story that is imprinted on each and every one of our lives. Friends, we need to remember that Jesus is and has always been working in you and through you. Now, I'll be honest, sometimes I can't see it in my own life. And I know that's probably true for you as well. And so sometimes we might actually need the help of each other. We might not actually need other people to go, yeah, you know what, you're going through a hard time right now and I know you can't see it, but you need to know that God's doing something here. You need to know that I see Jesus at work in your life right now. And this is the evidence of it. Sometimes we need each other to remind us that he is working in our lives. Friends, his goodness is evident. As evident as our struggles and our sin and our pain so often are. But so is his redemption and his restoration. So let me encourage you, find your story in God's big story and share it with others. Because friends, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you have God's goodness in your life. Yeah, I, I know, when I was growing up, I, I always wished I had one of those big dramatic stories. But whether your story is dramatic as, as others or not, the reality is every one of us has a story. If we're a follower of Jesus, every one of us has a story. And it might sound something like this. Before, I was like this. But now... I'm like this. And the difference is Jesus. The difference is Jesus. 
And so whether you were brought up in a Christian home or whether you've only known about Jesus and, and maybe have put your faith and trust in him recently, your story has power. Your story has power because your story ultimately is about Jesus. And so you can be a witness for Jesus, an eyewitness of who Jesus is and what he has done in your life. Friends, you are the evidence that Jesus is real to the people around you. You are the proof that Jesus is God. Your forgiveness and new life reveals that Jesus did die, that Jesus did rise again, and that we can all be saved through faith in him. In fact, throughout the Gospels and the history of the church, most people haven't had all the answers. Most people haven't been expert theologians. Most people haven't been very eloquent with words, but every follower of Jesus can share what Jesus has done for them. Every single one. And friends, it's through these stories of Jesus changing and transforming us that we can encourage each other. It's through these stories that we can see God's love in each other's lives. And when Jesus has helped us, or when he's loved us or comforted us in specific ways as we've been going through the hardships of life, he doesn't just do that for us. He does that so that we can then pass that on to others that we can see are going through the same struggles or who go through similar struggles after God has brought us through our own. Friends, it's through our stories and our lives that other people will hear and see Jesus. We are the experts on our stories and our stories are powerful because they are all the story of Jesus at work in all of our lives. Our stories point back to God's great story and they have the power to draw people to Jesus. Friends, if you look at the early church, Jesus entrusted his story to his disciples. Right? He entrusted it to his disciples to share the good news with others so that everyone could know about Jesus. But friends, it didn't stop when those eyewitnesses died. The story of Jesus not only continued in his first disciples, but it continues in us today. It continues in you, and it continues in me. So let's share our story. Let's share our stories with each other. Let's share our stories with the people around us. Let's be open. Let's be vulnerable. Let's be courageous. Being honest about our mistakes and shortcomings as well as about our, our strengths and our victories. Why? Because all of that points people to Jesus. It really is about him. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your incredible gift of your son. We thank you that through his death and resurrection, we can be saved. We can be forgiven. It is the greatest act of love in human history. And it shows us just how far we have fallen and yet just how much we are loved. And so God, we recognize that you are and you have been at work in each and every one of our lives. None of us are immune to sin, but none of us are also too far gone that you can't reach us. And you continue to work in us, you continue to work through us. And Father, whether we think our story of your work in our lives is, is big enough or dramatic enough or amazing enough to share with others, the reality is, is it is powerful. It is powerful. And you have not called us to change and transform lives. That's your job. You have simply called us to share what you've done in us. So Lord, I, I ask and I, I pray that you would give us the courage. Help us to take some of these questions. Help us to formulate our stories your, of your work in our lives. And help us to have the boldness to go and to share it with others. Whether it's quickly, shortly, whether it's, you know, just in, in, in a passing of, oh yeah, you know, I was able to get through this because of Jesus. You know, I, I, I was struggling, but Jesus comforted me. 
I went through an incre- incredible loss, but I still had peace because of Jesus. Lord, whatever it may be, help us to share you with the people around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.